start. Good afternoon, everyone. We are starting hearing number 15 of our 182nd uh, period of sessions. It's called the situation of the right to housing in the US. My name is Julie Samanti. I'm the first vice president and I am joined by the second vice president and, rap and country rapporteur, Commissioner Claudia Piovesan, and also the special rapporteur for ESCE rights, Soledad Garcia. I would like to start greeting our uh, attendees from the civil society and the state. And before we begin, I would like to uh, mention a couple of things. First of all, there will be a timer, a digital platform. I'm gonna ask you to be paying attention to it because it's very important. We also have bilingual interpretation and subtitling. This hearing is being broadcasted on several platforms. Let's begin. First of all, I'm going to tell you how we're going to do this. First of all, the civil society will speak for 20 minutes. I will ask you to organize the order in which you will speak and please introduce yourselves before you speak. Then we will give the floor to the state for 20 minutes. Then the Inter-American Commission will speak for 20 minutes. And then we will go to the final comments from the civil society and the state. Having said this, I would like to welcome you all. Now we give the floor to the civil society for 20 minutes. Go ahead. Go ahead, Karen. Is the civil society ready? My name is Catherine Moore. I have experienced a tremendous amount of discrimination just for being homeless. I have had my constitutional rights trampled on as a homeless individual to the point I feel like a second class citizen. While homeless on the streets, I had no door to lock to keep me safe at night. I had to stay vigilant, sometimes staying up all night. I was constantly worrying about homeless sweeps where the public works employees would raid homeless encampments confiscating and destroying the homeless property, leaving many with just the clothes on their backs. I once argued with one of the public works employees that the bicycle they were trying to confiscate was actually my property and not an abandoned property. It was nerve wracking enough to have to fight daily to keep the few possessions I had left from being taken. Then to add insult to injury, there are these city ordinances that make homelessness a crime, a misdemeanor, in fact. This allows the local police to issue camping tickets to the homeless. No one here today has been arrested for their housing status or lack thereof. Let me stop right there and remind everybody that I had to appear in court to plead guilty or not guilty on a camping ticket, which I received only because I was homeless. These quality of life infractions discriminate against an individual just because of their housing status. Finally, to avoid constant harassment from law enforcement and public works, I sought refuge in a drainage tunnel under the five freeway. I hid in a dark, damp drainage tunnel to keep from having my personal belongings confiscated and avoid going to jail for being homeless. Once I was off the streets and in an emergency shelter, I was not allowed to be in the neighborhood of the shelter at any time. I had to give up my right to free travel because of an anti-homeless agreement with the city. This agreement is called the Good Neighbor Program, a program meant to keep the homeless out of sight. Shelter operators make requirements where homeless residents who don't have a vehicle like myself cannot walk off premises without fear of eviction. I was required to take shelter transportation that only dropped off at one location four times daily. And if I missed these times, I was forced to stay in the shelter. In the past, when I had a home, I was free to leave at will instead of being held hostage by oppressive rules made just for the homeless community. Each day while entering the shelter, I was subjected to invasive searches by the shelter security. My Fourth Amendment rights were violated daily, having to walk through a metal detector and subject my property to being searched. I had to exchange my autonomy just to be housed, allowing security guards to lay hands on me inappropriately touching my body without my consent. 
and the male staff intentionally entering the women's dorm unannounced just to catch us naked. One day when I entered the shelter, I was wearing a spandex short outfit. When I passed through, the metal detector did not go off, yet I still had to be searched. And when I refused, the staff wrote me up for not following the rules with the threats of being evicted put back out on the streets. My complaints of the following incidents of sexual harassment fell on deaf ears. And as a survivor, this was extremely triggering. My testimony here today is only a mere fraction of the oppression that happens on a daily basis when you are homeless. I'm just one voice for the many not strong enough to speak for themselves. Thank you all for listening. Good afternoon. My name is Catherine Holcomb, and I want to first thank the commission for holding this historical hearing, the first of its kind before this commission. I'm honored to be part of this delegation on behalf of American University's Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Law. I also want to warmly thank Catherine Moore for opening our presentation. Her testimony grounds this discussion in the lived experiences of those whose rights have been most affected by the systematic violations occurring every day across the United States. What I hope to contribute with my testimony is to outline the United States obligations under international human rights law with respect to the treatment of people experiencing homelessness and how the use of ordinances that criminalize life-sustaining activities violates the right to adequate housing and other human rights that are binding on the US. Under the Supremacy Clause of the U.S. Constitution, treaties which are signed and ratified have the status of federal law. The U.S. has ratified several international treaties relevant to this hearing, including the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. Both treaties recognize the right to be free from discrimination, including in the context of housing. My colleagues will elaborate further on just how egregiously the US is failing in its obligation to ensure adequate access to housing without discrimination. The right to adequate housing is also prominently contained in the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. While the US has not ratified the covenant as the signatory, it must not act in any way that violates its object and purpose. Further, the covenant requires the US to progressively realize the right to adequate housing, which includes due process against eviction, affordability, accessibility, and habitability. These aspects reflect the notion that housing is a right and not a commodity. Further, the jurisprudence of this commission holds that the Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man is a source of binding obligations for the US, and this includes the right to housing. Homelessness itself is a prima facie violation of the right to adequate housing. However, the violation of individual rights does not end there. Policies criminalizing homelessness also violate the right to be free from cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, as they harshly punish people experiencing homelessness for life-sustaining conduct. The Convention Against Torture, also ratified by the U.S., sets out the right to be free from torture and other ill treatment and which includes acts that cause physical pain in addition to acts that cause mental suffering. In its 2014 periodic review of the US, the United Nations Human Rights Committee noted explicitly that punishing individuals for engaging in life-sustaining activity when they have no alternative available to them constitutes cruel and human and degrading treatment. Laws prohibiting people experiencing homelessness from life-sustaining conduct effectively negate the right to exist. The U.S. has an obligation to affirmatively address the general conditions in society that may give rise to direct threats to life or prevent individuals from enjoying their right to life with dignity. Accordingly, it is not only obliged to protect citizens against violations of their right to life, but must also facilitate adequate general conditions and access to effective social housing programs. The intent of my testimony is to outline the international human rights law framework to which the US is bound and against which its failure to recognize housing as a human right must be evaluated. 
my colleagues will now illuminate how this manifests on the local and national scales. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Eve Garrow, a policy analyst at the ACLU of Southern California. As anyone who visits this rich but unequal state knows, California does not respect the right to housing. Appropriations for safe, affordable, permanent housing are inadequate. Affordable housing wait lists can last up to an entire generation. And the gap between the cost of rent in the private market and what most people can afford to pay continues to widen. California represents 12% of the US population, but over 50% of all unsheltered US residents. 70% of the state's unhoused population lives in places unfit for human habitation, like parks, sidewalks, riverbeds, and cars. Instead of replenishing California's affordable housing stock, the state and local governments have too often waged a war against the survivors of this crisis. As Catherine so eloquently described, and as we document in our ACLU report, Outside the Law, the Legal War Against Unhoused People, they cite and jail people for being unhoused, banish them to remote and dangerous locations like deserts and riverbeds where they are literally left to die forcibly segregate them in jail, mass shelters, or parking lots, confiscate and destroy their property, withdraw resources like food, restrooms, and water that people without housing need to survive, harass and try to shut down the organizations from which they seek help and refuge, and even disrupt the attempts of voluntary groups and individuals who try to meet the survival needs of their unhoused neighbors. And these are only a few of the ways they persecute unhoused community members. These strategies are violent, exclusionary, and like all human rights violations, corrosive to the common good. They can be found in all regions of the state where they have resulted in tragic and needless harm, suffering, and death. Officials often justify persecution by depicting unhoused people as a danger to public health and safety, as somehow defective, as failing to play by the rules, as invading outsiders who do not belong, and as less than human. They describe their acts of removal, deprivation, and segregation of unhoused people as cleansing acts or the stamping out of contagion. Now we know that these are deeply troubling and dangerous tropes. And of course they actually turn the truth on its head. As Catherine has so urgently explained, it is unhoused people who are exposed to the most serious threats to their health and safety within the context of a public health and safety system that has failed them and has turned on them. State violence against unhoused people is escalating in California in the face of an affordable housing crisis that continues to fester. We must both fight for the affirmative right to housing and for the human rights of people who are persecuted simply because they cannot afford California's exorbitant rent. For example, we fight for the full funding of California's affordable housing programs and are working in coalition with other groups to pass state legislation that would prohibit discrimination against people who are unhoused, a category that is currently not protected under California's anti-discrimination law. The decision in California and throughout the US to violate the human rights of the most economically vulnerable people in society is, make no mistake about it, a political one, and it can and must be reversed. Good afternoon. My name is Brandon Green, and I'm the Racial and Economic Justice Program Director for the American Civil Liberties Union of Northern California. In my testimony today, I'll first discuss some of the work that the ACLU of Northern California has been engaged in around the issues of homelessness, 
alongside our colleagues at the other affiliates. And then I'll discuss contextual factors that contribute to Black families disproportionately high risk of homelessness. Finally, I'll highlight legislative campaign efforts that the ACLU and other coalition colleagues are engaged in to enshrine more protections for unhoused populations. My team at the ACLU of Northern California is currently engaged in litigation and investigative efforts across the region to combat the criminalization of homelessness. As I will note, Black Californians are disproportionately represented in every single one of the jurisdictions that we've been involved in. This is unsurprising. Depending on what estimates you look at, approximately 30 to 50% of all unhoused people in the state of California are Black. The truth is evident in our work and profiled in our recently released report, Outside the Law, The Legal War Against Unhoused People. For example, in Chico, California, where 44% of the county's unhoused population resides, Black people are overrepresented by close to a factor of two. In Santa Cruz County, Black people represent 1% of the county's total population, but 8% of its unhoused population. In the San Mateo County, where we recently litigated an RV parking ban, Black people make up only 2% of the total population, but are overrepresented in the emergency shelter, transitional housing, and unsheltered populations. In our state capital, Sacramento, Black residents are overrepresented among the unhoused population by almost a factor of three being 13% of the overall Sacramento population, but 34% of the unhoused population. The Black people overrepresented in the unhoused population is neither incidental nor accidental. According to an article from Cal Matters, nearly 50% of Black Californians lived in households that were cost burdened. Nearly a quarter paid more than 50% of their income towards housing costs. Rent burden being defined as spending more than 30% of income on housing and severely rent burden being more than 50%. This rental burden has not only pushed Black families closer to houselessness, but has also pushed Black families further into the suburbs, away from jobs that require longer commutes and away from services. This push out has also contributed to gentrification, something my, uh, sorry, this uh, push out has also contributed to gentrification, um, lowering the civic engagement of Black communities. According to Cal Matters, the Black population is plunged by 43% in San Francisco and 40% in Oakland, respectively. The intersecting factors have been of great concern for our colleagues and partners in Oakland who work on education equity issues, particularly around parallels between school closures, predatory lending, and disappearing Black population. Not only are Black people disproportionately represented among the unhoused populations of California, but they are also overrepresented in the carceral system. These two realities are inextricably linked. A 2008 California Health Policy Strategies Brief using data from Orange County, Los Angeles County, and San Diego found that there was a 20, 26% increase in the number of unsheltered homeless and homeless individuals from 2013 to 2017. Furthermore, it reported that of these unhoused populations, 70% reported a history of incarceration, 28% reported having recently been released from jail or prison, 13% had recently been under community supervision, and 32% had both mental health issues and had been formerly incarcerated. The ties between homelessness and the carceral system are important because of the impact that the carceral system has as an originating life factor for people. A report from the Coalition of Homelessness in San Francisco found that incarcerated people are between seven and 11 times more likely to have past experiences of homelessness than the general population. And between 25 to 50% of homeless people nationwide have a history of incarceration. An additional report finds that formerly incarcerated people are nearly 10 times more likely to be homeless than the general public. It is, important to, it is also important due to the ways in which jurisdictions develop and implement ordinances that further criminalize unhoused populations as a means of pushing these communities out. This approach has been borne out in the various jurisdictions profiled in our report, who as a means of either controlling or pushing out unhoused populations, enacted ordinances that have a cascading economic consequence and that prevent people from existing targeting homeless people for ticketing, for behavior that they can e neither prevent nor avoid, saddling them with debt that they can't afford to pay and placing them at risk for arrest via bench warrants that also serve to prevent them from accessing necessary services. These anti-homeless laws are crafted to avoid judicial scrutiny, but enforce to regulate public space like their exclusionary law predecessors, i.e. Jim Crow. They do this by creating scenarios where unhoused individuals are forced to either leave the jurisdiction or break the law and by empowering police to remove homeless individuals from public spaces. These approaches to homelessness have historical undertones and direct parallels to anti-vagrancy laws and segregationist policy wherein people of color were excluded from public spaces and accommodations because they were said to be dangerous or diseased. 
thanks to the commissioners for granting this hearing and, and the US government for joining us. Uh, I'm Eric Tars, legal director at the National Homelessness Law Center, which has advocated for more than three decades against the criminalization of homelessness and for housing as a human right. I see my time's uh, running short, so I'm happy to submit my full remarks in, in writing or uh, take some time at, at, during the, the concluding remarks. Um, but I wanna emphasize that right now, the right to adequate housing in the US is in crisis. Even before the pandemic, the federal government was only meeting the affordable rental needs of one in four poor renters, meaning three in four was paying unaffordable rates. And while the issues impacting uh, impact everybody across race, affordability issues disparately impact black, indigenous, and other people of color or BIPOC communities due to a centuries long legacy of discrimination and wealth extraction from these communities. <clears throat> the pandemic exacerbated all of this. Millions of Americans, disparately BIPOC, less, lost their income and their ability to pay rent, putting more than 30 million at risk of eviction and homelessness. Thanks to tremendous advocacy explicitly calling for housing as a human right, many cities and states, and eventually the federal government instituted eviction moratoria and appropriated billions of dollars in emergency rental assistance. The Centers for Disease Control issued guidance stating that homeless encampments should be provided with sanitation measures and not be evicted unless individual housing units like hotel rooms could be provided and FEMA guaranteed 100% reimbursement for renting those rooms. These sorts of steps showed that the US could find a way to protect the right to housing where there was a will. But unfortunately, that will was short-lived. And I'll talk more about that later. Thank you for your time. Muchas gracias a los representantes de la sociedad civil. Tiene la palabra el Thank Estado. Thank you, representatives of the civil society. The state has the floor for 20 minutes. No sé quién del Estado, por favor, va a hacer uso de la... I don't know who will take the floor in the state. Uh, it's me. Thank you, Commissioner. Apologies, uh, the mute was not working. Uh, good afternoon, and, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's public hearing to address this important topic. My name is Amanda Hickman, and I am an alternate representative to the U.S. mission to the organizations of, of American states. I am joined today by my U.S. government colleagues from the Department of Housing and Urban Development and the Department of State. The United States strongly supports the work of the IACHR and we regard the institution as vital to the promotion and protection of human rights in the Western Hemisphere. Public hearings such as the one today play a key role in the inter-American system to ensure that OAS member states are mindful of human rights challenges in their respective countries. We recognize that the United States, like all countries, has work to do. The Biden-Harris administration has committed to advancing the promotion and protection of human rights of all persons as demonstrated through a series of statements and actions. We thank the requesters for sharing your concerns with us today. However, before we begin, we would like to note that the US government has some concerns with the legal arguments that requesters made in their written submission and in their remarks today. Although requesters invoke specific provisions of the American Declaration in some instances, they also attempt to expand the competence of the IACHR by invoking an array of other international instruments. To that end, we reiterate our longstanding position that the non-binding American Declaration is the only relevant instrument which the AICHR is competent to evaluate and apply in relation to the United States. The United States recognizes and supports the promotion of economic, social, and cultural rights around the world, including to the extent that it asks us to improve access to adequate housing in a fair and equitable manner. However, it is important to note that there is no right to housing under which the United States has legal obligations arising from international instruments, nor does the non-binding American Declaration reflect any such independent right. Nonetheless, we have long recognized the importance of housing to the enjoyment of human rights. We acknowledge that more work needs to be done to ensure all Americans have equitable access to safe, quality, and affordable housing, and the United States is taking steps to prevent and reduce homelessness in a variety of ways. I will now turn it over to Senior Advisor for Housing and Services, Richard Cho, who represents the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development to share a statement. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda, um, and uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Richard Cho, and I serve as Senior Advisor 
uh, to for housing and services to Secretary Marsha Fudge at the U.S. Uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, first, let me start by saying uh, to Ms. Moore, thank you for sharing your story and experience. Um, I'm sorry and uh, sad that that uh, experience has um, been um, so uh, challenging. Um, just to share that among my roles is to advise Secretary Fudge on HUD policies and programs to address the crisis of homelessness in the United States of America. Uh, in addition, um, Secretary Fudge serves as the current chair of the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness, a statutory interagency council that coordinates across federal agencies uh, on our collect collective federal government response to homelessness. Um, I'm speaking here on behalf of HUD as well as the federal government to discuss progress that we've made uh, to address the crisis of homelessness and to ensure uh, access to adequate housing in the United States. Uh, both President Biden and Secretary Fudge have stated their unequivocal belief that housing should be a right and not a privilege, and that homelessness has no place in their vision for America. Housing is essential to health and to success in one's educational attainment, economic and financial success, and other life goals. And the cost of housing should not be so crushing and to take away families' ability to put food on the table or to cover other essential needs. In the greatest nation in the world, not one single person should have to sleep night after night in a homeless shelter on the streets in their vehicles or in other places not meant for human habitation. And yet our national data shows that an estimated 580,466 people on any given date were experiencing homelessness in America. Uh, that was from January, 2020. And we believe many more people experience homelessness over the course of the year. The most recent published administrative data that HUD collects on the number of people who use homeless shelters and other homeless um, temporary housing uh, programs indicates that 1.5 million Americans experienced sheltered homelessness in 2018. Uh, the homelessness data alone does not present the full picture of who experiences housing insecurity in America. Um, HUD's biannual worst case housing needs report also shows that in 2019, 7.77 million households had worst case housing needs, meaning that they were either paying more than 50% of their incomes towards rent and were very low income, uh, or were living in severely inadequate conditions or both. Homelessness and housing challenges also are experienced disproportionately by certain racial and ethnic groups. While Black Americans represent only 12% of the United States general population, they comprise nearly 40% of the homeless population in the U.S. Native Americans are overrepresented in homelessness at a rate more than twice their representation in the general population. Cases of worst case housing needs already disproportionately experienced by non-white Americans have increased for Black, Hispanic, and other households of color from 2617 to 2019. It's important to note that all of these data reflect the state of homelessness and housing security prior to the arrival of the COVID-19 pandemic, which uh, has been already stated has likely contributed to our nation's homelessness and housing crises. Recognizing that homeless shelters and other congregate settings are high risk settings for COVID-19 transmission, many communities had reduced their homeless shelter capacity and COVID-19 has also affected communities ability to provide homeless services as well as housing assistance. And the pandemic has also resulted in millions of households facing economic hardship that has affected their ability to pay rent and that has placed them at risk of housing loss due to eviction. COVID-19 has brought to light the growing crises of homelessness and housing insecurity in America and has made even clearer that homelessness and housing insecurity are a public health crisis and the existence of these crises threatens the health and safety of the entire nation. But while the pandemic has, uh, it may have exacerbated homelessness and housing insecurity, it did not cause them. Homelessness has been on the rise over the last four years, despite having decreased in prior years. From 2010 to 2016, the single night prevalence of homelessness declined uh, from 637,000 people in 2010 to 549,000 people in 2016, a reduction of nearly 14%. For certain populations, such as military veterans or families, those reductions were even steeper. Veteran homelessness went down by 47%. Homelessness among families with children declined by nearly 23%. We at HUD believe that those decreases in those years were in large part due to the federal leadership and the national coordination that was provided through the development of the first ever uh, federal strategic plan to prevent and end homelessness known as opening doors. Aligned with the recognition of the importance of housing to the enjoyment of human rights, much of that plan was uh, focused on uh, promoting the community implementation of the housing first approach in which people experiencing homelessness are assisted to obtain permanent housing as quickly as possible using a variety of interventions that provide rental assistance or affordable housing alongside health and supportive services and without first requiring that people complete addiction treatment or demonstrate sobriety or enter inpatient psychiatric treatment. 
Over the last few years, however, severe resource constraints have limited communities' ability to provide housing first interventions. HUD's data shows that prior to 2021, communities typically had only one available housing first intervention for every seven individuals who are experiencing homelessness and approximately one available housing first intervention for every three families who are experiencing homelessness. As a result, more people have become homeless in the last few years than have been assisted to exit homelessness. HUD's data showed that from 2017 to 2020, the number of people that newly entered homelessness has exceeded the number of people that exited homelessness by an average of 8,000 households per year. Not surprisingly, homelessness has risen by over 5% from 2016 to 2020, and much of the gains that were achieved in reducing homelessness from 2010 to 2016 have been lost. The single night prevalence of homelessness in America in 2020 is back to what it was in 2013. Homelessness among single individuals rose by 15% and the number of people who experienced unsheltered homelessness rose by 28%. From 2019 to 2020, veteran and family homelessness um, has increased for the first time in many years. Uh, and also for the first time ever since the point in time counts that have been conducted, the number of single individuals who experienced unsheltered homelessness in 2020 was higher than the number of single individuals who are sleeping in shelters, more people outside than inside. In many communities, the rise in unsheltered homelessness and the emergence of homeless encampments as the most visible manifestation of unsheltered homelessness has led to greater pressure at the local level to resort to more aggressive tactics involving law enforcement and public works to clear homeless encampments, to displace residents, to seize and remove, remove property, as well as to pass uh, and enforce laws prohibiting sleeping, lying down, or performing other basic human functions outside. HUD and the US government's position is clear that the civil and human rights of people experiencing homelessness must be protected. Under the Eighth Amendment, all Americans have protections against cruel and unusual punishment, and arresting and jailing people for performing basic human functions like sleeping outside when they lack other options is a violation of constitutional rights. Moreover, we have People experiencing homelessness are protected under the Fourth Amendment uh, from the uh, unreasonable and warrantless seizure of the, and the destruction of personal property and possessions. The federal government is working to combat the criminalization of homelessness through our annual Continuum of Care program competition, which provides $2.7 billion in grants annually to support communities' responses to homelessness. HUD has included an incentive in, the, uh, in that competition for communities to take steps to reduce the criminalization of homelessness. HUD has also provided communities with tools and guidance developed by the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, the Department of Justice, and from national organizations like the National Homelessness Law Center on how to avoid the criminalization of homelessness and implement constructive alternatives. We've also shared guidance by USICH on how to respond to homeless encampments that emphasizes the use of homeless outreach to connect people to housing and services, and which ensures that communities adopt policies and processes that uphold civil rights. But ultimately, the administration believes that the best way to combat the criminalization of homelessness is to end it, specifically by helping people to stay in their homes and avoid housing loss, or when we cannot prevent housing loss, to help people re-enter permanent housing with access to services as quickly as possible. The Biden-Harris administration is committed to achieving an end to homelessness for all Americans and to ensuring access to adequate housing for all Americans. And while the realization of this uh, vision is necessarily progressive, I would argue and contend that more progress has been made in the last year to realize this than in many years. Uh, in the last year, the federal government sprang into action to help millions of Americans avoid evictions and housing loss. In response to a national eviction crisis that was exacerbated by COVID-19, the President Biden's American Rescue Plan expanded federal funding for emergency rental assistance to, to total more than $46 billion, as well as make needed improvements to the program. Through a whole of government approach, the federal government has provided guidance and technical assistance to help states and communities to quickly deliver emergency rental assistance to Americans, as well as encourage them to develop new eviction protections, including court-based eviction diversion programs, direct aid to tenants, and improving access to legal representation in housing courts. The administration has also taken action to prevent evictions among HUD-assisted renters. From following the Supreme Court's decision to end a nationwide eviction moratorium in August 2021, HUD adopted a rule that prohibited the eviction of tenants facing eviction for non-payment of rent during a national emergency from HUD-assisted uh, public housing and other properties with project-based rental assistance without first providing a 30-day notice period that includes information about available federal emergency rental assistance. Uh, in November, HUD awarded $20 million for eviction prevention and diversion programs uh, in uh, 10 cities across the country. 
The program supports experienced legal services providers to provide legal assistance at no cost uh, to low-income tenants who are at risk or are subject to eviction. The Eviction Protection Grant Program is part of our continued work as part of a whole of government approach to support families recovering from the public health and economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. We've also taken several actions to assist homeowners facing financial hardship from losing uh, their homes due to foreclosures. Uh, in June, we extended the, for federal, the foreclosure moratorium for a final additional month until July 31st uh, and a forbearance enrollment window through September 30th. We provided three additional months of additional forbearance for certain borrowers. Homeowners that have government-backed mortgages receive enhanced assistance to reduce their monthly payments by roughly 25%. Through the American Rescue Plan, the Homeowner Assistance Fund is providing $9.961 billion to states, D.C., territories, and tribes to provide relief to homeowners impacted by COVID-19. These funds can be used for assistance with mortgage payments, uh, uh, homeowners insurance, utility payments, and other specified purposes, and homeowners can access these funds through designated state agencies. And they will be integrated with the payment reductions uh, options outlined above, providing additional payment reduction to borrowers who need it and borrowers whose mortgages are not backed by federal agencies. With regard to rehousing people who are already experiencing homelessness, the Biden administration is firmly centering our response to homelessness on the housing first approach which entails providing tailored levels of housing assistance and supportive services to help people re-enter and remain in permanent housing without first requiring them to complete treatment or achieve sobriety. The evidence is clear that housing first works. Housing first interventions like permanent supportive housing and rapid rehousing and rental vouchers help people to exit homelessness more quickly, remain stably housed, achieve better health and reduce their use of costly crisis services like emergency departments, inpatient hospitals, jails and prisons. Through the American Rescue Plan, uh, HUD has been able to provide communities with historic resources to quickly increase the availability of housing first interventions to rehouse people experiencing homelessness. We've provided 70,000 emergency housing vouchers to rehouse people experiencing or at risk of homelessness, including those fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence, sexual assault, or human trafficking. We've also awarded $5 billion in home investment partnerships grants to help communities to build additional affordable and permanent supportive housing, as well as provide temporary rental assistance or fund supportive services to address homelessness. To support communities to use these resources with urgency to rehouse uh, people experiencing homelessness, Secretary Fudge and other administration officials launched a new national initiative known as House America, an all hands on deck effort to address the nation's homelessness crisis. Through House America, we are calling upon mayors, county leaders, governors, and tribal nation leaders to set specific numeric goals for the number of people experiencing homelessness that will be rehoused in permanent housing and the number of new permanent housing units that will be placed into the development process by the end of 2022. Over 35 state and local leaders have joined to date from California to Maine, from Seattle to Miami, from Chattanooga to Cherokee Nation, and more leaders continue to sign on every week. Through the American Plan Rescue, uh, Rescue Plan resources and the engagement of state and local leaders through House America, we hope that at least 100,000 households experiencing homelessness will obtain permanent housing and that we will add an additional 20,000 new units of housing to address homelessness by the end of the next year. Ensuring access to adequate housing in America also entails addressing discrimination and ensuring equal access. Uh, so in January, President Biden issued an executive order um, uh, instructing the federal government to pursue and prioritize a comprehensive uh, approach to affirmatively advance equity for all, including people of color and other, uh, others who have been historically underserved, marginalized, adversely affected by persistent um, poverty and inequality. Um, we've uh, issued a memorandum on redressing our nation's and the federal government's history of discriminatory housing practices uh, and policies. Uh, and we've uh, been work taking steps to try to strengthen fair housing protections over the last year. In February, we announced that uh, we will administer and enforce the Fair Housing Act to prohibit discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. And that means when a housing provider refuses to sell rent or otherwise make housing unavailable, based on a person's sexual orientation or gender identity, the housing provider potentially violates the Fair Housing Act. HUD has also withdrawn the previous administration's proposed action that would have weakened the equal access rule, uh, which ensures that all individuals, regardless of their sexual orientation or gender identity, have equal access to HUD programs. So equal access to HUD programs that serve people who are homeless or at risk of homelessness is essential in addressing the challenges faced by transgender and gender non-conforming persons who are experiencing homelessness. We've made it a priority to fund fair housing enforcement. Uh, the administration's current budget request contains a 17% increase uh, in staffing for fair housing enforcement um, com uh, compared to the prior year. While HUD has awarded over $71 million in grants, 
uh, over the past year to civil society organizations participating in the Fair Housing uh, Initiatives Program. Uh, we've also taken steps to address the need for access to adequate housing in response to climate change and the effects of climate crisis. Uh, uh, climate change, we know, uh, creates new risks and exacerbates existing vulnerabilities to communities across the uh, United States, presenting growing challenges to human health uh, and safety, quality of life, and economic prosperity. For low-income households and communities of color, climate change exacerbates uh, those, those challenges, um, such as aging infrastructure in the city, siting of toxic waste facilities. We are taking a whole of government approach to ensure that at least 40% of overall federal investments in climate and clean energy are delivered to disadvantaged communities. If the actions taken over the last year are a significant step in the progressive realization of ensuring access to adequate housing in the US, the president's Build Back Better plan would represent a major leap. Uh, Build Back Better includes historic investments that would provide affordable housing to millions more Americans, uh, and it would invest in programs that would increase the supply of rental housing, rental assistance, including for people experiencing homelessness, uh, increase housing for older adults and people with disabilities. Um, Build Back Better would make home ownership a reality for more Americans, as well as address the historical disparities in home ownership rates among Black Americans. There's more work to do ahead to ensure that all Americans have access to uh, housing that is both affordable and adequate, uh, and to protect Americans from housing loss and housing discrimination. Um, the steps and actions made in the last year by the U.S. government demonstrate that while the realization of ensuring access to adequate housing is progressive, it need not always be slow. Significant progress has already been made, and the enactment of the president's Build Back Better plan would build upon this momentum to accelerate the realization further. We have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to realize the president's vision and belief that housing should be a right, not a privilege. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias a la representación del Estado y le vamos a iniciar desde la Comisión Interamericana. I would like to thank the state representatives and now the commission will begin its participation. First, I will give the floor to Commissioner Pio Besan, the country reporter. Thank you so much, Vice President. Uh, I start expressing my gratitude, my deep recognition for civil society efforts and all the information shared with us by civil society and state representatives, valuable, precise, and very clear data, even disaggregated data um, were shared here. And concerning a very, I'd say, important and, and tragic and dramatic topic, which is the right to adequate housing and the lack of that. And the transformative mandate of the Inter-American Inter Commission has this ambition to give voice, to raise the voice of the voiceless and to give visibility to the most invisible and the most uh, vulnerable groups in our society. So uh, um, I learn a lot and I'm, I'm really glad to be part, um, to take part of this hearing. I'd like to share three main concerns um, the first concerning the right to adequate housing, I'd like to address to the state um, representatives. Uh, it has to do with the impact of pandemic and climate change um, and the increase of the crisis of the lack of access of right to adequate housing. Um, if you could, if I could have more information, uh, if you could develop more, about the human rights approach response to those two, um, I'd say two um, events which even aggravated and exacerbated uh, the level of inequality and the situation of homelessness. My second question uh, is addressed to the states as well, to the state representatives, because I, I took note and listening to the civil society um, representatives and also the state representatives, but uh, I took note that although after descendant in the US, they are 12%, they are 40%, almost a half of the ones who lack access to right to adequate housing. So based on the, this disaggregated data and this, I'd say we have evidence of a strong pattern of discrimination. I'd like to understand more the, the policies, the public policies to repair, to, to revert this kind, this, this 
pardon, the strong pardon of discrimination. Um, I do believe that this even uh, characterize um, a situation of indirect discrimination because you could have public policies which could be prima facie based on neutrality, but those public policies have a disproportional impact uh, considering the Afro-descendant community. So uh, for that, um, is there, are there public policies uh, based on, I'd say, um, let's say ethnic uh, equality or integrating the racial, the racial injustice? That's my point. And even according to the data that the commission receives, we have two phenomena, the feminization of poverty and the ethnization of poverty. And if it's possible, this I would ask the state, but also to civil society, if you could have, uh, if you could provide us with more information, um, especially this disaggregated data, including gender, race, we took note, but gender as well. Uh, and finally, my third concern, and this I'd like to ask civil society, um, we, lear we learned when we took note about all the public policies concerning um, adequate housing, House of Amer Americans. And um, I'd like to hear from you, which are the main gaps of those public policies that we just heard is there any best practice considering the federal state? We learned the situation of California, but is there any best practice in a particular state in the US that could be visible, identified, and could guide um, a proper public policy concerning the right to adequate housing? And for us, for the commission, is that right, a human rights per se, but is a condition to the full exercise of other rights, such as right to health, right to be safe and free from violence, right to drinkable water, and even in a pandemic context, is a key measure, uh, I'd say, for uh, proper prevention concerning pandemic. So thank you so much for all of you, and thank you, uh, First Vice President. Thank you, Commissioner Piozan. Before giving the floor to Rapporteur Soledad Garcia, I wanted to make some comments along the same lines. I think it's very important to have both the state and the civil society here. These hearings are a space for exchange, for dialogue, and in um, and they have a lot to do with the mandate of the commission. And I think it's been evident how the principle of non-discrimination that regardless of the fact that a state has ratified a treaty. This is a use Cohen's norm. It's an imperative norm, a superior or higher norm. And this is what we're trying to uh, see when we listen to the explanation by the civil society, but also the answer from the state. That's first of all, but this principle, this of non-discrimination, I also wanted to remember that uh, rights are indivis is indivisible. We cannot divide them. You know, the, the, the um, pandemic has shown us that it's a fake debate, right? The debate of what rights are more important because the pandemic has shown us that the right to health is so important that there have been even restrictions on the freedom of circulation, which had which didn't even happen during the dictatorships in the southern corn cone. And why am I saying this? Because uh, you mentioned the American Declaration for Human Rights and the American Declaration on its eleventh article says that every person has a right to have their health um, protected with. Uh, social measures as well that has to do with uh, housing, clothing, health care. So I wanted to remind how um, the principle of non-discrimination and the uh, principle of indivisibility are at stake here. And I would like to know, to get more information from the civil society and the state, and if you don't have it now, you can send it later, 
I would like to have information about the differentiated impact that this uh, that is occurring because of the discrimination, considering uh, the, a lack of access to housing. Is there a particular impact on uh, Afro-American families and also the situation of homeless uh, children? And additionally, this risk of gender-based violence that affects women and children, this particular risk to be um, to suffer sexual violence when they don't have access to housing. It will be very important for the commission to have information about that. And I'm thinking about the general situation of intrafamiliar violence, where many a time women don't file reports or don't speak about what's going on, particularly because they fear the fact that they will lose their housing. So I will apart from the, whatever comments you can share, has this vision of indivisibility and non-discrimination been, uh, has this been considered in terms of uh, gender violence, based violence in those places where the right to housing is not observed? That's all for me. Now I will give the floor to Rapporteur Soledad Garcia Munoz. Thank you very much, Commissioner. It's a pleasure to share this hearing with the two vice presidents of the commission. This is a very important hearing. It's difficult to speak after both of you because you have mentioned the most critical topics in terms of the information we have received. I would also like to thank you and recognize the work of the civil society in the US to protect the rights of homeless persons. And I would like to especially recognize and greet Ms. Catherine Moore for her testimony, for what she mentioned about her own experience and the difficult situation these persons are facing in the US. I would also like to recognize the, um, or the information presented by the state. I would like to acknowledge the um, sincerity of the state and its approach because uh, the words of Mr. Josh are very clear. He says that uh, housing should be a right, not a privilege. And that is a goal the commission shares. And of course, my rapporteurship as well. Thank you for the information on the legal framework in the US. I would like to know uh, as a compliment to what Commissioner Mantilla was mentioning, I was wondering, well, because the treaties that were ratified by the US provide um, international pillar to um, achieve, to, to join efforts in terms of access to housing, especially by Afro uh, descendants. and several treaties, even the American Convention on Human Rights, this generates a series of commitments. And um, Article 26 of the American Convention underlines uh, the progressive development of ESCE rights. I would also like to mention an international intra-American treaty that also recognizes the need and the commitment of the American states to respect and res uh, to respect the uh, access to housing, which is the charter of the OAS, because in its article 34, item K, it refers to the commitment of American states to warranty housing to all the sectors of the population. And this goes hand in hand with the American Declaration, which is an instrument that was not binding, but because of uh, the international, the, the history of uh, international relations. And as the court has even mentioned, it's more and more important for the inter-American system. And it is the instrument that the commission applies to all the member states of the OAS. Having said this, I would also like to say that my rapporteurship has been following this topic with concern. We said it on our annual report from 2020 on the uh, ESCE 
rights report on the rights of afro descendants we also published um a press release in the context of the pandemic calling the american states to develop actions to fight poverty and extreme poverty and in particular the situation of homeless people having said this in terms of inter-american standards i would like to underline our concern for all the information you have presented and i have a couple of questions first of all it would be important for the commission and my rapporteurship to better understand the causes for this phenomenon the causes that make people in the u.s uh, to need to live in the streets why they live in the streets we have understood that, that there are mental health issues, poverty, lack of employment, climate change, but it would be very important for us to better understand these causes and also to know uh, from the state uh, how they care for the health of uh, homeless persons, in particular during the pandemic and considering the vaccination programs against COVID-19. Of course, if you can send us written information afterwards, that would be very important too. Our rapporteurship has been following President Biden's um, President Biden's uh, proposal, the Build, Build Back Better bill. We would like to know the status of that bill. We understand that there would be a special section on housing, and we think that would be very positive it would be very positive if it was passed and of course my rapporteurship is at the disposal of the civil society and the state to continue this dialogue i am very interested in maybe holding a working visit to any of these states for example california where maybe on the ground we could uh, experience and see the situation of people living in the streets and contribute to improve the situation through our recommendations. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Rapporteur. I will now give the floor in this second round of interventions to the civil society for 10 minutes. I thank you. Um, I can start off again. I'm Eric Tars at the National Homelessness Law Center. Um, and uh, I want to thank uh, the commissioners for their excellent questions and the uh, administration and, and particularly Richard Cho for his testimony. And, and as you said, the sincerity with which the uh, US government is approaching this hearing. Um, uh, in response to uh, the question about some positive examples, um, I think what you saw with the pandemic, um, as I was uh, saying at the, at the end, uh, is a demonstration of what is possible where the will is. You know, the um, government stepped up to provide housing vouchers at a level that's actually needed to address the number of people who are threatened with eviction. Um, the CDC uh, issued guidance stating that uh, communities shouldn't view homeless encampments as uh, threats to uh, or should, should be addressing uh, homeless encampments as a public health issue, not evicting them if they can't provide individual housing options. And then, um, you know, we saw a, a number of communities, uh, again, California in particular, taking advantage of FEMA reimbursement in order to be able to uh, provide those hotel rooms for tens of thousands of people who would otherwise be living on the streets. Um, but we've seen that these efforts have been too little and, and too small and, and too short lasting. So, you know, the eviction moratorium that helped keep people in their homes has expired. Um, the emergency housing uh, vouchers uh, that uh, Richard had mentioned uh, haven't gotten to many people who need them. Um, you know, they, they are remaining unused um, because of state bureaucracies that are preventing people from getting them. And just from uh, a, a lack of infrastructure in this country that's been so starved of funding to be able to distribute them on the scale that's been needed. And so in some communities, there are people who are still on the street, there are people who are losing their homes to eviction, and they are returning those vouchers and the funding back to HUD 
uh, to redistribute to other communities, even though the need continues to exist in their communities because they just haven't made them available. And people don't understand that they are available in some cases because we don't, this has not been the way that the US has uh, behaved for too long, that we, we have, we've denied aid to too many people for too long that they can't trust and know that it's, it's actually there. Um, in terms of uh, the criminalization of homelessness, we have seen some uh, positive steps taking place at the, the state level. Uh, a number of states have introduced what are called unhoused bill of bills of rights or right to rest acts that would um, stop uh, communities from enacting these laws criminalizing homelessness. Um, uh, none of the ones that are strong enough to really make a difference have passed, but the, the legislation exists uh, as a model um, that's out there. Um, and uh, again, as, as has been pointed out, um, these kinds of practices are important because of the disparate racial impact. Um, and, and as an equitable matter, uh, this would, would uh, be a big step forward passing these sorts of ordinances um, that would help to protect the predominantly uh, Black, Indigenous, and, and other people of color who are living on the streets and keeping them out of the criminal justice system, which only puts more barriers between those people and getting them uh, off of the streets. Um, and we've seen other positive steps from the federal government. The Department of Justice has opened up civil rights investigations uh, into the police treatment of homeless persons in Phoenix and Minneapolis and Louisville. Uh, we certainly want to see those continue, um, and, and we appreciate the, the affirmative uh, statements that uh, the government made that uh, the treatment of homeless people must be consistent with the Eighth Amendment and with the Fourth Amendment. Um, I think our concern is really that uh, all of these things won't be enough, uh, even with Build Back Better. It's, it's a big step, but it's not enough to undo the decades of disinvestment, um, uh, let alone make full reparations for the centuries of stealing land from and preventing home ownership for BIPOC communities. And so we call on this commission to hold the US to account to make sure it makes a formal equitable plan to implement the human right to housing and end the criminalization of homelessness in the US. I'll turn over to anybody else if they have responses. Uh, thank you, Eric. Um, so Eve Garrow, once again, I, I'd just like to very quickly respond to you a couple of the questions and thank you for such um, such thoughtful questions. So I want to um, elaborate a little bit on what Eric said about um, some positive uh, um, examples of policies that would actually protect the right to housing. I mean, in, in some sense, I don't think that this is a complicated question. If the United States is going to respect the right to housing, that means that people should get safe, affordable, permanent housing as an immediate response to their needs. That requires appropriations that expand with need um, so that every person immediately receives housing. Um, when they are in a crisis, when they are displaced from their housing. That would solve the houselessness crisis. Um, and, and that is something that we don't see in, in the United States. Um, block grants, capped amounts of funding are just, you know, um, quite frankly, not going to solve this problem. We do see a few examples in the United States. One is um, the Supplemental um, Nutrition Assistance Program, that's SNAP. So if you are eligible, for example, for SNAP benefits, you don't have to um, wait for a year, two years, five years, 10 years, sometimes 20 years to actually get on a list in order to receive SNAP benefits. Um, you get them as an immediate response to your need when you're eligible. Um, now, there are issues with the SNAP program, but it is a good example of a program in the United States um, that actually does, in some sense, respect um, the, the right of people to, say, to, to nutritious food. 
Um, there was another question around um, the causes of, of houselessness and housing displacement. And I, I would encourage um, people to think of the main cause as the failure of the government to actually respect the right to housing and to, and to um, develop and pass policies that would, would, would require appropriations to expand with need. People, individual issues, you know, people, people are always going to be housing insecure. But if we had a true right to housing, um, that is the solution and the lack of um, the um, uh, of the United States, the 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 fact that the United States does not respect this right is actually the primary cause of of houselessness. Um, I mean, I, I, I just think this is this is the only way to really to really think about this issue. And finally, I just want to really quickly say that we agree wholeheartedly that um, housing justice, that the right to housing is a form of gender justice and the failure to respect that right is a form of gender based violence, um, which uh, which Catherine really illustrated so clearly in her testimony. And I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Catherine. Just, just really quickly, um, I just wanted to reiterate um, that again, in all the jurisdictions um, here, and as it was noted um, nationally, uh, unhoused folks are disproportionately Black, disproportionately Indigenous. And that is both because of the historic and current harms uh, that are perpetuated on these communities, which means that to adequately solve this issue, there needs to be uh, restoration um, for those communities who have been denied access. Catherine? Thank you, Brandon. In Maslow's hierarchy of needs, a need is something that a person has to have to be healthy. In this period of human needs, it begins with the most basic needs like food, water, shelter, to the most advanced needs of self-actualization. These needs have to do with our natural desire for a predictable, orderly world that is somewhat within our control. I believe that housing is a human need, a right, if you will. Without a house, you've lost your base, your foundation from which to function. You have no safety or security. You become exposed to the harsh elements with no protection or comfort. Without a house, you have no adequate standard of living. You have no bathroom to shower or shave in to start your day. No door to lock at night before you lie down to sleep. Without a house, you spend all day traveling miles, searching for the basic biological requirements for human survival, food, water, sleep, and the use of a bathroom. These needs provide the grounding for human rights. These life-sustaining activities are detrimental to an individual's existence. The ideas of human rights and basic needs are closely connected. Human rights, the rights that apply for every person because they are human. Housing is a human right. The intent of my testimony today is to give you all a glimpse into the current oppression that the homeless have to deal with daily the harassment, the discrimination, and the demoralizing views from the local authorities, the criminalization. I hope to have opened your eyes and given you a glimpse into a problem that is deeper than just having no place to live, a problem of having rights and no equal protection under the law. I leave you with a quote from Gandhi, the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. Thank you all and have a good day. Muchas gracias, Catherine. Y tiene la palabra ahora la representación del Estado. De Thank minutos. you, Catherine. Now the state has the floor for 10 minutes. La representación del Estado puede empezar, sí. The state, would you start? Amanda, I'm not... Is it okay if I respond? Uh, well, so thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the, the, the questions from the commissioners, um, as well as the responses from the petitioners here. Um, I want to address a few uh, uh, questions that I that I heard, um, in particular, uh, uh, regarding the steps that the uh, federal government is taking 
uh, to address the uh, racial uh, inequities and disparities that we see uh, in homelessness uh, and housing access. Uh, we, uh, as I mentioned earlier, are working under President Biden's executive order that calls on um, all of the federal government to look at ways that we can um, address the uh, uh, inequities experienced by um, a variety of groups that have experienced um, historical marginalization, including um, Black uh, Americans and persons of color, as well as other um, groups. Um, and as part of that, we are looking, uh, taking a, a systematic look uh, at the ways that um, policies across the federal government are um, both uh, contributing to and or can help to reverse systemic racism and racial inequities. Um, for HUD and our housing access, we see uh, that uh, the racial disparities in homelessness stem from a variety of historical um, actions that have been taken, uh, both uh, the redlining of neighborhoods that has reduced access to uh, um, homeownership opportunities for Black Americans, uh, as well as um, uh, uh, historical uh, discrimination in the housing market, um, along with um, other uh, um, uh, policy uh, that have um, uh, perhaps indirectly contributed to uh, the racial disparities that we currently see in the homeless system. And so we are taking steps to address what are uh, many decades of, of, of policies, um, including uh, within uh, HUD, to try to address those disparities. Um, we are working on um, uh, helping to uh, increase home ownership uh, uh, rates among Black Americans to reduce that disparity. Uh, one of the things that we've done is to uh, create a new uh, 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 council that is looking at the ways that uh, um, home values for, for Black homeowners um, are historically undervalued um, based on their being in Black neighborhoods and taking steps to try to address that. Um, we've also taken steps to um, increase access to credit. Um, and so um, looking at ways that um, uh, the, um, access to credit um, has barriers based on, on race. Um, we've also um, reinstated the discriminatory effects rule for fair housing. Um, so we're strengthening fair housing protections and looking at ways that not only um, uh, intentional um, uh, aspects of uh, fair housing violations are um, looked at, but also the degree to which policies that lead to discriminatory um, effects or disparate impact um, in that when uh, people of, of color, Black Americans are uh, um, uh, sort of uh, indirectly uh, have lower access to housing or homelessness programs that um, um, actions can be taken. Um, and we are looking at specifically how that can be used um, as a potential tool for addressing um, the racial disparities in homelessness. Um, I also want to um, clarify uh, and just want to note that that's just the beginning. We, we recognize this will be a long process. Um, we are undoing uh, many decades of, of policies that have led to those disparities and discrimination. Um, and um, I will say that um, as part of the president's Build Back Better plan, uh, we are uh, committed to ensuring that we are, uh, would, uh, if enacted, uh, those programs would be implemented with uh, a focus on um, addressing um, and advancing equity. Um, I want to also address uh, uh, sort of a, a clarification uh, regarding uh, something that Mr. Tars mentioned. Um, there have been challenges with the implementation of the emergency rental um, assistance program, which is intended to prevent evictions. Uh, and but and that's separate from the 70,000 housing emergency housing vouchers that HUD has issued, which are more specifically intended to help rehouse people who are experiencing homelessness into permanent housing. Um, those emergency housing vouchers are actually being utilized um, very effectively. Um, there have been challenges with the uh, eviction prevention emergency rental assistance program, which have now been corrected and many more uh, millions of Americans are getting rental assistance payments. With regard to HUD's emergency housing voucher program, which is intended to help people experiencing homelessness, um, that program uh, really um, began implementation um, effectively um, in August. Uh, and thus far, we've already seen that um, over 5,900 people experiencing homelessness have been rehoused into permanent housing settings through those vouchers. We're continuing to monitor the progress and ensure that um, uh, communities are working with urgency to connect people experiencing homelessness into vouchers. We're also examining the way that communities are um, uh, um, prioritizing populations for those vouchers to ensure that we are advancing equity through that program as well. Um, I think, and then uh, with regard to uh, the question related to um, uh, gender violence and justice um, and homelessness, um, we are committed to um, uh, addressing the needs of, of people who have experienced and women who have experienced um, uh, violence, um, domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, uh, and or who have been victims of human trafficking. Um, the American Rescue Plan uh, emergency housing vouchers that I mentioned, as well as the $5 billion in grants to help build additional housing 
um, can does include um, people who are experiencing homelessness um, as a result um, or who are attempting to flee domestic violence, um, sexual assault, um, or uh, human trafficking. And so um, want to recognize that we are committed to addressing the needs of um, survivors of, of, of gender-based violence as well. Um, and happy to elaborate on that as a follow-up. Muchas gracias. No sé si el Estado añade algo más. Thank you. I don't know if the state wishes to add something else, or we, do we conclude? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. We, we took note of the additional questions and can follow up. So thank you. Uh, the state uh, concludes at this time. Okay. Eh, muchísimas gracias. Vamos llegando al término de esta audiencia. Thank you. Okay, we are reaching the end of this hearing, and as I said at the beginning. And as Soledad Garcia said, this is a historical hearing for the Inter-American Commission for various reasons. We were speaking about the indivisibility of rights, the uh, discrimination intersectionality, but we also value at the commission, on the one hand, the work of the organizations and the direct testimonies you have brought here, because you are your voice, but the voice of many people like you that have hope and with for which we work the commission and i would also like to thank the presence of the state the commission really values these exchanges these advances and we are at your disposal to keep on contributing the rapporteur Soledad garcia talked about the possibility of a work visit that is something we should coordinate but the commission would be really interesting in participating and engaging and exchanging obviously with the approval of the state. Okay, we are reaching the end of this uh, hearing and let's try this to be the beginning, not the end of an exchange. And we are at your disposal. Thank you, good afternoon. The hearing is closed. Have a nice day. Thank you.